Hello, I am Jimmy Green. Uh, I am the Energy Policy Manager at the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, we're a regional nonprofit conservation and energy consumer organization with members in Tennessee and throughout the Southeast. We focused on energy policy, including nuclear issues, since 1985. I'd like to thank you for holding the public hearings today. The main point I want to make is uh, we wanted to make sure that the NRC is aware that TBA is beginning to enter into the process of developing an updated integrated resource plan. Uh, probably at the end of this year they're going to get started seriously on that. This will inform the question of uh, whether or not the power generated by this plant is needed. Um, and so we would recommend that uh, you closely follow the IRP process at TBA to uh, see how that calculation plays out. Um, now clearly not using this energy is going to be the most uh, efficient way to go and the least environmental impact. And that's, that's the thing we're always recommending, energy efficiency and renewable energy as a clean and preferred alternative. Um, and there are some other environmental issues I just wanted to mention that are tied specifically to the Sequoia plant. One is the water requirements. That's been a big issue recently, the amount of water that these plants take in and the temperature rise. I'm sure you're looking at that. Vulnerability to flooding obviously has been in the news recently um, and still seems to be an issue that hasn't been resolved. Well, I guess technically it has been resolved, but not in your favor. So. Uh, the ice condenser design is, is, uh, is a problem um, and the fact that, I'm not sure how this is going to play into it, but the Sequoia plant has been uh, mentioned as a possible producer of tritium and it has also been mentioned as a possible um, plant, a possible, the possibility to use the Sequoia plant to burn MOX fuel, the mixed oxide fuel. This, I think Brownsbury was the first choice, but Sequoia was mentioned on that too. So when you uh, go into this environmental impact thing, I think that's something you really have to keep to take into account, the possible use of mox fuel in this, in this thing. And that's about all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you. Gary Morgan will be next, and then Tim Anderson will follow Gary. Six minutes. Thank you. My name is Jerry Ward. I'm Scottsboro, Alabama. I'm here representing the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League. You might say, well, what's this guy down the river, 100 miles, concerned about up here at Sequoia? Well, the one factor, other than the air we breathe, and maybe the relatives that we may have that connects us all, is the river back over here. The, what happens upriver affects the folks downriver, whether it be a nuclear power plant or a coal-fired facility or dumping in that river. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today, not necessarily about the river, but about emergency planning and evacuation zone. Uh, one of the lessons from Fukushima was the discovery that, hey, radiation just does not stay within when there is a catastrophic failure of a system such as occurred at Fukushima, which has occurred at Three Mile Island, which occurred at Chernobyl, and the many near misses which has occurred within the United States, if that radiation gets out of that co container, it doesn't say, oh, look at here, here's that 10 mile zone. No, it don't do that. It goes where the wind blows it. And in Fukushima, we learned that may be 120 miles downwind. It may be 160 miles downwind. That is a concern, and this is the reason one of the lessons of Fukushima was consider the EPZs, the emergency planning zones, and emergency evacuation zones. Currently, the TVA sends out, and the NRC approves, these emergency evacuation zones. And this is critical. There is nothing more critical in the environment than us, the people. We are the most critical. We are, you know, when you, I have a background in the military, in nuclear surety and personal liability. We talk about nuclear surety and personal liability, we always talk about a pyramid. In the bottom of that pyramid, and all things nuclear, is the people. 
this community and the surrounding communities, the Sequoia or any nuclear plant, is the people that support that pyramid. You got resident inspectors here, and I'm sure they do not want to see TVA employees, NRC employees that work here, plus the citizens, the good police that's here, the mayor, the city council, everybody, the citizens, nobody wants to see a serious accident. But Lord forbid, if that accident does occur, you want to be ready for it. And one of the lessons of Fukushima has, has came out and has been very uh, blatantly, we are not ready. And I'm talking about we as Americans. And the regulator, the power providers, we are not ready to deal with that unexpected accident. Because in our emergency planning, we tell them radio you guys, oh, you can't go out of this 10 miles of them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, it just don't work that way. I am asking the NRC before they go forward with any uh, relicensing, whether it be support or anybody else, you better make improvements. I highly suggest you make improvements on your emergency planning and your emergency evacuation zones. It is required. And, and this is being considered in the various tiers of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Please include it as a high priority as a quarter. We don't, we don't like to think about it that unthinkable. And, and we know that everybody does the best job that they can to ensure that that nuclear reactor will cross the ridge over right next to the river is very safe. But if that unthinkable does happen, you want to be prepared, you want to be ready for it. The emergency planning zones, the emergency evacuation zones, 10 miles is not sufficient. Fukushima has shown this. Other accidents have shown this. The NRC's own planning has shown this. The weather shows it. And climate change is a very important factor. Uh, extend the 10 mile zones out to 25. The food intake zone, which is currently 50, needs to be extended out to 100 miles. You need to train, you need to plan, and be ready for that unforeseen accident. Defense in depth, good program. The, uh, the other programs that the NRC ensures that the power providers implement, good programs. But if you're not ready for that unforeseen accident, that, that which you cannot uh, fathom in your minds, then you're gonna kill people. And I, nobody in this room wants to see that happen. Be prepared. Extend. Think about NRC. Please think about extending the emergency planning zones and the emergency preparedness zones in this community. And that includes, of course, I was reading in documents that where the NRC passes out the potassium iodide. Down in Chattanooga, the NRC passed out potassium iodide since they're about 15 miles away. No. You only think about that 10 mile zone. Think about outside that zone. I mean, if you think about where are you going to get help right here? The local police and local fire are going to be very busy. It's where they're going to get help is to their neighbors because I know that, that all communities in Tennessee Valley have reciprocity agreements that where they can call in for extra help. But if you don't plan, if you don't bring in Chattanooga, if you don't bring in uh, the other areas over to the west into this area, then you're failing in your planning. That is something I have noticed. Many years in the military has showed me, ha has demonstrated that one of the greatest, and Fukushima shows, that one of the greatest failures is the failure to plan adequately for an emergency. I ask you to pay specific attention to the EPZ and Mercy Paris. Thank you. Tim Anderson is our next speaker, and Sandy Kurtz will follow Tim. Hello, my name is Tim Anderson. I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I'm here today for adopted ID NRC 2013 0037. Uh, citizens of the United States have a right under the National Environmental Protection Act of 1969 to request that the generic environmental impact statement be thrown out and a third party comprehensive risk analysis that takes all elements of such risk to the community, to our commerce, to the environment into account. A report that truly defines the human health effects of low dose exposures and mental stress to the population for living under such risk. 
what are the true effects of cancer-causing agents leaching in our, into our environment? What are the true impacts of increased permanent storage or production of high-level nuclear waste? Due to the permanent storage issue, this proposed action should be considered a major federal action and therefore require a new environmental impact statement under Section 102.42 U.S.C. 43.32. NEPA, the Environmental Quality Improvement Act of 1970, has amended Section 42 U.S.C. 43.71 and Section 309 of the Clean Air Act as amended under 42 U.S.C. 7609. And we hereby request the study. Uh, also, any study under these rules should also include a comprehensive study to determine if there is the speculative energy demand and whether it could be met through, met through other sources that are now viable, including renewable energy. Uh, and the answer to that is yes, we can, and no, we don't have to have, a, and we don't have a true need to build more reactors and can certainly phase out these 25-mile evac zones over the next decade. Maybe the decision needs to be postponed for five years to reassess the needs and the dangers based upon real-time, up-to-date health studies. In any event, I'm sure it's the goal of the agency to move forward. We, we would ask that any uh, study include the long-term health effects of low, mid, and high-level radiation on the surrounding community and the health effects on humans, born and unborn, and the effects on humans and the environment now and in the future. Any in addition, any action by the federal agency requiring a large <coughs> burden on the area of water supply should provide a comprehensive study as to the effects of the massive water usage, including the effects to the marine and human life associated with scheduled releases of various radioactive isotopes and proposed average water temperature increases on the surrounding water supplies and how that relates back to human consumption rights and long-term environmental impacts. We also ask that the Commission include the following internationally recognized studies as a basis for any comprehensive human health impact studies. These reports show a positive link between the increased cancer rates and the release of low, mid, and high level releases. There are, there are many studies regarding the fallout of Chernobyl and the true effects to the population that are not being considered. These reports, even by the most conservative estimates, state that over one million additional cancer cases have been attributed to that disaster. And the studies that should be included are the American Academy of Sciences 2008 Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, the report says no safe level of radiation. The European Committee on Radiation Risk argues that the existing risk model used by the NRC does not take internal exposure into account. High rates of internal exposure will mean a dramatic increase in cancer risk for Fukushima residents, with as many as 400,000 additional cases predicted by this model by 2061. The Office of Science and Financial Assistance Program noticed 9914 low-dose radiation says each unit of radiation, no matter how small, can cause cancer. The German Federal Office of Radiation Protection titled Epidemiology Study of Childhood Cancer in the Vicinity of Nuclear Power Plant shows a positive link to young children developing cancer more frequently when they live near nuclear power plant. The American Cancer Society states that ionizing radiation is a proven human carcinogen. And they go on to say that people living near or downwind of a plant are known as downwinders. Any EIS should include a comprehensive study as to the effects on the citizens and the commerce and the environment of having on-site storage, above-ground storage of high-level nuclear waste specifically the dangers of such storage and the fact that the storage site is already three times its design capacity. TBA also does not have adequate insurance to cover a major event, nor is there a public procedure in place on how local and regional businesses will be compensated for loss of business-related income, relocation of businesses, residents, loss of personal items, homes, and cost of relocation. How does TBA propose to relocate an entire city? 
in the event of a major event? How do they plan on paying for a complete economic shutdown of the evac zone? These are the risks we as citizens in the affected region have to burden so that the TVA can continue to generate energy through nuclear reactors. The World Bank, here's it, where do we, we don't have these risks with solar energy or other viable renewable energy forms. Where do I go when I can't go home? Where do I go when my bank is closed? Who notifies the elderly and disabled that they need to get out of the area? Where's your plan and where's your money? The World Bank projects that the evacuation of the 19 mile radius implemented by the Japanese government costs $225 billion. Please take these into consideration. Thanks. Sandy Kurtz, you're up. And following Sandy will be Don Sager. Hi, everyone. I spoke earlier today, uh, and, and I just want to summarize some of those statements that I, that I made so we can, uh, for those who worked at the earlier session, might hear um, all, of, all of our concerns, a very long list of people, by the way, with Bellefonte Efficiency and Sustainability Team, and uh, others against intensity river radiation. We have a table outside, so if you want to pick up some information after this, um, feel free to stop by there. Um, we, uh, I talked to about, we, you heard something about the flooding, the flooding concerns, the flooding mitigation concerns, uh, possibility of an earthquake, uh, climate disruption patterns which should be updated. Uh, we were concerned, concerned about that. Um, the idea that uh, tritium is being made uh, uh, because of the Department of Energy's request so they can take that tritium to boost the making of their uh, bombs in a, in a commercial nuclear facility, which is the, the line between military and commercial nuclear facilities is getting really, really fuzzy. Uh, the, the mix, the radioactive mix to oxide fuel use, uh, also experimental. That's, that's a problem. And um, the, the crowding of the uh, radioactive fuel rods in the so-called spent fuel pool, which is actually a higher in radiation than, than uh, when it started out in the reactor, when the rods started out in the reactor. Um, that that is, a, is a concern, and uh, we would advocate for moving those the used fuel rods in as long after they cool, and it takes about five years for them to cool, to remove those and put them in hardened cast, waste cast storage. Um, this radioactive trash doesn't need to be in the pools where, it's, where it actually has more chance of, of exploding. Um, we were con I talked about the, the um, alternatives that were offered by um, TDA's draft EIS here, uh, application talking about two alternatives, uh, none of which mentioned the alternative of just shutting it down. That would be an alternative that would be, we think would be good, and, and the idea that we don't need to replace that energy or that it could be replaced with um, solar alternative or other, other alternative energies. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit here though about radiation doses. The, apparently, it seems that uh, the statement that the public will, conti will continue at current levels associated with normal operations and that these doses also for the occupational doses to employees are going to remain the same when the license is renewed. So we don't need to worry about that. But these doses are all well below the regulatory limits, so they, they say, and so we, we don't need to worry. Another 20 years of, of this is uh, not good because, in fact, no dose of radiation is safe and, and it's cumulative. So the additional time there is, is going to continue to 
uh, expose us citizens in a growing population, an urban population, uh, with more and more of this, of this uh, radiation that is emitted on a daily basis from a nuclear power plant. The thing that happens is those daily radiation dose levels that they recommend seem to go up if there's more in the air, and they call it, then they call it background radiation. But at Fukushima, that's what happened. When the accident happened, suddenly the people that were supposedly uh, not supposed to receive a dose at a certain level, suddenly it was okay for those people to receive a higher level, and that was, that was the standard that they set. So the radiation standards seem to, to uh, change depending on how much is actually in the air. And our radiation background, so-called background level, has been rising over, over these years. So it is cumulative. There is cancer risk, even without the accident. And um, I think the other thing is that the radiation standards, and maybe NRC can look at this in over, overall, the standard for what, how much dosage you could get is based on a, what they call the reference man. And the reference man is a German white male, about five foot nine, and a hundred and five foot four, and 150, 70 pounds, something like that. Does anybody qualify here? The truth is that the, that the studies now show that it is women and infants and fetuses that are more that are more uh, subject to radiation uh, dose and cancer cancer events. So the, the problem is that the standards themselves are not right, and I think that really needs to, to be looked at. The other thing that I wanted to um, emphasize here was that with the numerous accidents, grand shutdowns, leaks, dishonesty, and equipment monitoring lack of proper reports filed, ignoring safety procedures, poor nu nuclear employee education, as Brown's Ferry Fire thing, and the installation of non-certified equipment parts, we learned about just the other day, does not assure the public that TVA can properly run their nuclear plants. And that, in ice condenser technology, we should uh, not renew the license. I'd like to um, offer my turn to Brian and Ann that were not here for the earlier session to speak. Well, there's three more speakers to speak. Oh, Greta? Oh, that's Gretel. You're the, you're the last person that signed up? <laughs> All right, I think we can do that. Thank you. So, you'll each have nine minutes apiece. Thank you, Bob. I feel so blessed not to have to follow Anne, which is a very hard act. <laughs> My name is Brian Paddock. I'm an attorney. I happen to also be the Tennessee Local Council for Challenge to the Environmental Impact State Center um, for the Watts Bar 2 unit, which is still under construction and for which there are still legal contentions pending as to the impact on water temperature and aquatic uh, resources. I suggest that the NRC staff take a close look at this because all of the aquatic impacts <clears throat> heretofore in the licensing of these reactors was done based on modeling uh, and not based on any real world measurement. Since then, TVA has gone back and done a considerable amount of real world biological assessment uh, and quite frankly, they've done a pretty good job of it. And you might look at what they've done in terms of dealing with the Watts Bar 2 uh, litigation contest and see if, if you don't think they need to do the same thing with respect to the impacts of the uh, cooling water uh, and resulting hot water from the plant under consideration here. I chair the legal committee for the Tennessee chapter of the Sierra Club I was a Sierra Club representative to the last integrated resource plan stakeholder groups. I've spent more than 14 full days in meetings with TVA staff, with many other stakeholders, including industrial users, 
and so on. Um, so I'm fairly familiar with, with TVA's pattern of generation activities. I've also attended many NRC hearings, and particularly those where the NRC comes down and talks to TVA about things, including whether it's ever going to be able to finish the Watts Bar 2 plan and what went wrong there. Um, I have a very direct personal interest because while I'm now living in Jackson County, I do own a condominium on Manufacturers Road uh, south here. And um, that's where my wife and I intend to retire. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, but it probably means a continuation of not getting paid. Um, and also uh, having my grandchildren visit me there. First, I would call you to your attention, and I think this was raised in the questions. We seriously challenge that the assumptions in the generic EIS uh, are still valid. I think many of them are out of date, and I was glad to hear that the uh, GEIS is being revisited. <coughs> it's not clear to me how that fits in and how well that will be done uh, to provide, in fact, an adequate foundation for the SEIS. If the, uh, GEIS is still in ferment uh, or is out of date. Uh, building an SEIS on a site-specific basis on top of it, it seems to me, is legally uh, questionable under, under the uh, National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, and quite frankly, we have to express some discomfort with confidence in the NRC. For example, recently there was a discussion of the venting that needed to be available um, in post-Fukushima circumstances. And the commissioners voted uh, to say, yes, uh, the staff should go ahead and, and, and uh, prepare a regulation to require vents, but it would not require the filtration of radioactive materials through those vents. In other words, the vents are, will be, uh, if the regulation is finally adopted and if the uh, operators finally install those vents, the current policy posture of the commissioners is that they will not be required to filter radioact radioactives out of that and thus you are going to permit, um, obviously in, in very exigent circumstances, the release of radiation. Uh, so you might look which way the wind is blowing where you live from this planet. NEPA requires a hard look uh, and that's a very interesting <coughs> test for a lawyer. What is it? What's a hard look? And that, I've read hundreds of of NEPA cases, uh, and uh, it varies. But it does not appear here that there has been, or is so far, an active consideration of what would be called the no action option, which would be not to issue a license extension and to put the plant into a posture where it was being decommissioned uh, at the termination of the existing license period. Uh, that would be very interesting. Uh, when this SEIS comes out, I would just, and I, and I mean this respectfully, uh, remind the NRC and TBA that any federal litigation challenging the SEIS will probably be tried in Chattanooga. The judge will live downwind of this plant. He may be very interested in the quality of the environmental assessment that is done with respect to this license extension. Now, the first issue that bridge that needs to be crossed has to be the need for electricity. As a matter of fact, TVA sold fewer kilowatt hours in 2011 than it did in 2010. And then it sold fewer kilowatt hours in 2012 than it did in 2011. And the projection for 2013 is that it may decline again. People are in fact adopting efficiency uh, and uh, despite TVA's extremely lame attempts to push energy efficiency. With respect to energy efficiency, I would offer for the record um, two items. One is TVA's uh, commissioned by contract energy partner study, which shows it's doing about a third of the 1% year over year uh, reduction in energy usage that it could accomplish. We've been, pro I've sat on stakeholder groups, we've been promised for two years running we would see new, better, and different energy efficiency programs uh, out of TVA, and that's all been frozen. And it's been frozen partly for a lack of revenue and partly because they don't know how to do anything but sell kilowatts. Um, 
And secondly, the GAO did a, same, a similar study, full consideration of energy efficiency and better capital expenditure planning, GAO, and they say, we don't think that TVA has uh, really looked at the realistic potential for energy efficiency. So those are being on offer. The, uh, one other factor you should look at is that the USEC, the United States um, Enrichment Corporation, which is a uh, shock and a boondoggle, has been for years to create uh, nuclear fuel, has announced that it is closing this year. That represents 5% of the entire load uh, and production of electricity. So uh, we're going to have a 5% decline this year, apart from any other energy efficiency. On the 40-year design life, I offer you a copy of the AP report as it was summarized in our local paper in Chattanooga, saying, uh, historically, everyone thought the plants were designed at best the last 40 years. So the basic theory that the aging hardware is the only thing that we really should be looking at and control is far too narrow. Uh, we will also be offering further written comments and we would point to the problems of TVA's nuclear management, um, many of which has been, much of which has been mentioned in these, in these uh, comments up to this uh, point. I would just point to a personal experience where I went to the hearing uh, on the Browns Ferry One red status and the chief inspector for NRC came and I have never seen a plant chief inspector, and I've been to a lot of hearings, stand there and for an hour list what was wrong in the plant and essentially say that TVA had shown that it was very good at making lists of things that needed to be fixed, of safety problems that needed to be addressed, of equipment that was not operating properly, but all it did was make lists. It could never seem to get any of the significant, including safety-related equipment uh, and problems, addressed. And that's why now they've been in a red status for so long. And this is T T TVA's nuclear management, typical situation. They can do one thing right at a time, maybe. They managed to install the new steam generators um, in the plant at issue here, but while they were at it, they fell behind in trying to get rid of the red tag on uh, Brown's Ferry, for example. I would associate the club's comments with also the comments made by the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy and those that have been made, made earlier on the ice condenser problem. Thank you. Ann Harris. I'm as bad as the NRC. I brought my documents with me. They're all NRC documents, so I don't expect them to be disputed. My name's Ann Harris, and I live in Rockwood, Tennessee. Ann, please, please move the microphone a little closer to you. The feedback knocks me down. <laughs> we need, we need, we need, we need to record what you say. Trust me, you're getting what I say. <laughs> NRC, I request that you identify and evaluate the following items for potential environmental <coughs> impacts prior to any extension of the Sequoia Nuclear Plant license request for another 20 years. Substandard parts in the area of parts associated with the Watts Bar parts issue. There is evidence of shared parts. This is a long-standing issue it's been on the books since Unit 1. I was instrumental in putting this on Region 2's list in the mid-1980s. And I'm going to go through these pretty fast. So if you've got questions, you'll have to hit me up at home next week. <coughs> Trimming issues for weapons for DOE and DOD are beyond the design basis, not only of Sequoia, but for Watts Bar. Sequoia was not designed for the T-bars in the numbers that are needed to produce the amount of tritium needed to fulfill the DOE contract. And why should we have a fight with Iran and North Korea for doing the same thing that we're doing here at Watts Bar and Sequoia? The number of scrams being so bad, you identified them in an inspection report tells me that the stress on hardware has to be terrible. What happens to those items that crumbles 
and no one is looking or there is not a pre-announced happening. What about the concrete? What about the floors? What about the sirens? What about the control room? The ice condenser story knows no problems. <coughs> the buckling floors, the sublimation, the hardware, the basket, the screws, nobody knows because nobody's mind in the store around the ice condenser. And the, we certainly know that the ice condenser was certainly not designed to fit another 20 years. It's not going to make it another 20. So everybody needs to start getting to higher ground. The earthen dams. Now, NRC, you're going to tell me that this only concerns Watts Bar. Watts Bar and Sequoia both are on the same reservoir. Both of them will go down if that dam at Watts Bar goes down.